All right, if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Proverbs chapter number 9. Proverbs chapter number 9, we'll just read a few verses here, verses 7 through 9. It'll be really our main text, what we'll preach on. Proverbs chapter number 9, verses 7, 8, and 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Lord, we pray you'd bless the time in your word. Thank you for this book. I pray you'd set me aside, Lord, that these words may come forth from your scriptures to help us, to instruct us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you'll notice if you want to outline the chapter, it's only 18 verses, but the first five verses is another call from wisdom. We've noticed this all through our study of Proverbs. Every time you turn around, the Lord is calling out and saying, Hey, do you want to be wise? Do you want to listen to me? And wisdom does that in, in verses 1, 2, and 3. She's built her house. She's uh, set this table. It's kind of like in Matthew 22, the wedding feast, where uh, the parable's given and the, the feast is spread. The, the wedding feast is ready, and he's asking for people to come. And so here you have this same type of scenario. Verse number 4, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, come and eat of my bread and drink of the wine. So we have this call of wisdom. And then in verses 6 through 9, what we're really going to preach about tonight, we have the confronting of wisdom. Wisdom confronts people. Truth confronts people. And of course the Lord uses us oftentimes to confront people as we talk to them about the Lord and about truth. And he uses preaching, he uses his word. And so truth and, and wisdom confronts people, verses 6 through 9. And then we have the compensation of wisdom, verses 10 through 12. There's a result of it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge is given. Notice in verse 11, thy days shall be multiplied, the years of thy life shall be increased. Then he makes a statement in verse 12, If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. If thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. In other words, you're going to get what you, you're going to reap what you sow. If you reject the truth and you reject wisdom, you're going to get that. If you take it, you're going to get the blessings that come from taking wisdom. And so you see the compensation. And then finally, at the end of this passage, we see the counterfeit of wisdom. We have the foolish woman in verses 13 through 18. She's calling for people says, hey, don't listen to wisdom. Listen to me. Come eat the stolen bread. It's always better, you know, if you eat a watermelon, you stole out of the watermelon patch. You know, come and eat of the stolen food. Come and just party it up. Just live with me. Don't, don't, don't think about where your path's going to end. Don't think about the future. Just have a good time. And, of course, the consequence in verse number 18, He knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. They never show you, show you the other side of the billboard. You know, they never show you the disease that comes from sin. They never show you the, the sickness. They never show you the results, the broken homes, the broken lives, the emotional instability, the, the suicide, the death, all of that. They never show you that. So... I want to focus on, uh, because we preach some on these other things, I want to focus on verses 7 through 9 dealing with the scorner and the wise man. This is my question tonight. The question for you would be, are you a scorner? Now in Proverbs we have all kind of different people listed. We have a wise man listed. We have a foolish man listed. We have obviously a wise woman. We have a foolish woman. And we have uh, a scorner listed all through Proverbs. So we're going to look at that tonight. Um, and we'll see this contrast in verse 8 between a scorner or a scoffer is what we'd call them today. Somebody that would mock and a wise person. So to scorn would be to reject uh, and to, be, uh, to keep someone in open contempt. To disdain, to mock, to jeer. If somebody laughs to scorn, that means they ridicule. They're making fun of. To be scornful is to be full of scorn. 
Uh, like you, you take a, a little kid, you might call him a little punk. You know, if he's like a junior high, high school kid, and he's, you know, walking around like he's got sense and he don't, and he's walking around like he knows something and he doesn't, and he's walking around like he's tough and he's not, and he's, you know, he's, he, he, you call him a smart aleck. You know, he's walking around and he's just smart on the mouth. He doesn't respect authority. And, you know, that's, that's the uh, new generation now. There's no respect for authority. As a matter of fact, they're teaching managers and people in leadership how to deal with millennials. And you, they say you're not supposed to treat them, you know, like in the old way. When the boss said something, you did it. He said jump, you said how high, or he'd fire you. And he wouldn't fire you because he was offended in something you believed. He'd fire you because you wasn't doing a good job. Totally different world we're living in now. But used to, you respected authority, but the scorner doesn't respect authority. The scorner is his own authority because there is no final authority. There's no final authority as far as the laws of the land are concerned because it really doesn't matter what they say about you breaking a law because the laws can be changed or overridden. There's no final authority because they've been slapped on the wrist so many times. There are no repercussions for doing wrong. So therefore, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore it is set, fully set in the heart of the sons of men to do evil continually. Our, bless our law enforcement. You know, you spend all this time to get a case on somebody, all this work, I mean, talk to them. It takes time, not just, you know, taking a guy and throwing him in the back seat, but all the paperwork and all the legal stuff you've got to work through to make a case. Then the judge fishes with his guy's daddy, so he writes it off and says, okay, he can go home. Yeah. Corruption. And so what do you have? You have a nation full of scorners. University student, he's a mocker. You know. You mean Noah got all the animals on the ark? That's a joke. Uh, excuse me, do you know how big the ark was? Do you know how many animal species there are? Scorners say, don't preach to me. Scorners say, get off my back. Leave me alone. Now what we're going to see here in these passages, he, he's going to describe a scorner. We're going to look at that. And then he talks about not, not rebuking a scorner. And let me preface it by saying this. In the Bible, preachers definitely confront scorners. It happens. I mean, Jesus Christ preaches to the Pharisees. I mean, he confronts them. Stephen preaches and gets killed for it, and they're scorners, and they mock him. And, and we'll look at some examples of scorners. We'll see the, the righteous cause going against the scorners. But on a practical, one-on-one -on -one basis, the truth of this passage, and some of you, you have them in your family, you have them people that you work with, maybe friends or people that you're trying to deal with. You need to come face-to-face -face with the fact that some of you are dealing with scorners, and you're wasting your time. And he says, reprove not a scorner. I mean, try to give them some truth, but the Bible says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. I mean, you know, try it a few times, but after a while, you're just going to stir up a mess because they are a scorner. And hopefully as we look through this and we describe a scorner, you can identify them real easy. Somebody said you can always tell a scorner, but you can't tell them much. Um, there was a true, supposed true story I read about in Sweden. There was a man who was married happily for 17 years, and all of a sudden he met a younger woman. So you know what he does. He falls head over heels for her, divorces his wife, and they live in this nice luxury apartment. He tells his wife, look, I'm divorcing you, and I want you out of here. I'll buy you another place. I will rent you another place. She says, okay, just give me three days. He says, okay, I'll give you three days. Do whatever. I won't be here. I'll be gone. And uh, then three days you're out and we're mo we're mo I'm moving her in. So the first day she spends time getting everything packed up, works it and gets it all boxed up. The second day she gets the movers to come out and move and everything. Then the third day she sits one final time at her nice table that she had, lit her some nice candles and made her a nice meal and had a whole several pounds of shrimp. And she ate those things and just enjoyed herself. And then with the leftover shrimp that she had, she proceeded to go around to all the um, curtain rods that were hollow. And she stuffed all the curtain rods with that leftover shrimp. And then she moved out just like she was instructed. And her ex-husband and his honey moved in. First few days it was fine, but after a while there was a smell. They just couldn't seem to get out of the house. They tried the carpet cleaning. They tried all kind of things. 
You say, what is that an example of? That's a woman scorned right there. <laughs> now let's look through a few verses here. You're in Proverbs already, so we'll just flip through. And let's talk about a scorner. Go back to chapter number 1. <clears throat> Notice the pride of a scorner and how a scorner is proud. Look in chapter number 1, verse number 22. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And scorners, look at this, delight in their scorning. They're proud of it. I'm an agnostic. So what's the translation of that word? Uh, in the Latin, it comes from the Latin, it's called ignoramus. I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. They're proud of their scorning. Go over in chapter number 21 of Proverbs. What you'll notice about a scorner is they are eat up with pride. You can't tell them anything. Proverbs 21. And even sometimes if you can prove them wrong, it's always like, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> Never can admit being inferior. You know, there's a whole lot smarter people than me. There's a whole lot stronger people than me. There's a whole lot stronger and smarter people than you. And more talented people than you. I guarantee you there is somebody on this planet of however many 8 billion people we have that... You are inferior to. Don't that just hurt your feelings? Scorners are full of pride. Look in Proverbs 21. Verse number 24. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. That pride rises up so much so when somebody confronts him with truth and wisdom, he is filled with wrath against that because he doesn't want to hear it. He's made up his mind that he's right. And really, that's what sends people to hell. What sends people to hell is the fact that they can admit they're wrong and they need Jesus Christ. They can admit that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. That's the root of the problem. They're scorners. Look in chapter 13 of Proverbs. Notice, as we describe a scorner, notice that a scorner does not listen. Proverbs chapter 13. Verse 1, Proverbs 13, 1, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. He will not listen. Look in chapter 22. Notice what this leads to. Proverbs 22, 10. Proverbs 22, 10. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Amen. So a scorner is contentious. Only by pride cometh envy and contention, right? So you have this, this proud scorner that's always contentious, and the reason... There is antagonism, and the reason there is hatred and wrath is because of a scorner. A scorner depends on ridicule and contempt to fight his enemies. Uh, look over in chapter 29 of Proverbs. Proverbs 29. Look in chapter 29. Verse 8. And here, here's how scornful people affect society. Proverbs 29, 8. Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. Notice verse 9. If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. And so scorners destroy people and they destroy, destroy societies. Look over in chapter number 14. Then I'll give you some examples, and you can think of many examples. But one more of these. Look in Proverbs chapter 14, and verse number 6. A 
A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. A scorner can't find wisdom even if they look for it. You say, why? Because their heart's not right. Especially when you deal with Bible truth, this book will reveal itself to you based on your heart. That passage we quote often in Hebrews chapter 4, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing center of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What's a discerner? The word of God is. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. So this book reads you while you read it. If you are a scorner, you're not going to find the truth. Because you're not looking for it. As a matter of fact, scorners will find heresy and they will find falsehoods and they will feed on inaccuracies. If you remember Ahab when he was rejecting God's word and rejecting God's truth that he was sending through the prophets and he finally... Because Jehoshaphat, the king of the south, he wanted to have a preacher come up and preach. And Ahab had all these other false prophets. Finally said, okay, I have one guy that preaches like you're talking about, Jehoshaphat. But I hate him and I got him locked up in prison. Jehoshaphat says, well, bring him out here. I want to hear some preaching. And he brings out Micaiah. And when they finally cut through the chase, Micaiah finally says, Ahab, God sent lying spirits in the mouth of all these prophets to deceive you. That's a, that's a terrible truth. If a man doesn't want the truth and he re- rejects against the light that God sends him, that light will become lightning. And God will deceive that man. We we'll read in Bible prophecy in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 in the end times, the Bible says, Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Scornful people are in a very dangerous place. I'm not saying they can't repent, but until they repent of their scorning and their mockery and their scoffing and their pride, they're lost cause. Now, I'll give you some examples. Like I said, you can think of some. The first one I think of early on in the Bible is Cain. If you remember with Cain and Abel, God had obviously passed down through Adam what the acceptable sacrifice would be, which would be a lamb, a blood sacrifice for fellowship with God. And Abel had brought that blood sacrifice. And God had respect unto Abel in his offering, but unto Cain in his offering he had not respect. And God even went to the extreme to communicate with Cain and said, Look, if you do us well, shalt thou not be accepted? And your brother will will, will submit to you and you'll rule over him. He even tried to reason with Cain. You can't reason with a scorner. That just infuriated Cain more. Instead of, sometimes we get the idea, and I I get it too, I understand, and sometimes you think, man, I just got to get the truth to people, and, and you do. You need to witness, and like Brother Dale prayed, with this thing that's going on, it's been kind of weird. People don't want to take stuff that you've touched. They don't want to take tracks. I understand it's just a little different right now, but we still have a responsibility to tell people about Jesus. And we need to do that. And I know sometimes we take that responsibility and we think, man, if people just knew the truth, some will and some won't. Cain had the truth, and God actually came to Cain and told him the truth, and he did not, the truth did not change him one bit. There's no excuse for anybody in the United States of America. You can type John 3.16 in your phone and it pops up. There's enough Christian and gospel witness all over the place if they want the truth. There's no excuse. But you think of Cain as an example of a scorner and that thing ate at him and ate at him and that jealousy and that pride and that, that uh, bitterness toward his brother. And maybe even Abel talked to him. I don't know. I kind of think that Abel might have come up and that sealed his fate because the Bible said they were out there talking in the field. Maybe Abel said, look, man, you hadn't been able to do a sacrifice. I would have no problem as a free gift. I would give this lamb to you and you could take this lamb as a free gift. He he didn't want to hear that. He was thinking, man, if I can't do it on my own, if I can't work for it, really with Cain and Abel, you see the only two religions there are, do and done. 
There's a religion that you try to do and prove that you're justifying yourself, and there's a religion that's based on blood sacrifice that shows that you can't justify yourself. Great example of that, but Cain, in his bitterness and in his scorning, he sealed his own fate. I'll give you another one. I preached about Elijah the other day. So what about Jezebel? That's a scornful woman. Man, God rebukes her in more ways than one, but He rebukes her by way of the Mount Carmel experience when God sends fire down, consumes the sacrifice, the stones and the water, licks up everything, and then Elijah kills those prophets of Baal. Jezebel is a scornful woman. She wants the head of Elijah. And she's not going to stop till she sins and tries to get Elijah killed. What about Haman? Remember Haman, how that every time he saw Mordecai the Jew, because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to a man and worship a man, he was filled with anger and spite, and he was a scorner. And he not only wanted to destroy Haman, he sought to destroy all the Jews. Turn over to Jeremiah, look at this real quick. I gave you Stephen and Christ. Of course, Stephen was martyred in Acts chapter number 7. And Jesus Christ eventually was uh, betrayed and, and um, put on the cross by way of the sway of the religious leaders and Pharisees. Remember how they got in the crowd and they said, not this man, not Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. Remember that pressure? That's that scornful crowd. Look over in Jeremiah, 20, uh, Jeremiah 37. This is Jeremiah the prophet. Now, a lot of times when you read through Jeremiah, you're reading all these prophecies, so you don't a lot of times see the, the storyline that's going on behind the scenes. But Jeremiah is a prophet, and he preaches there to the southern kings. And one of the last kings he deals with is Zedekiah. And Zedekiah, I don't really call him a scorner because he would listen to Jeremiah, and he even tried to help him out from time to time, but Zedekiah had so much pressure from the princes and from his sons and from all the constituents and the patriots of the day. He had problems with patriotism because the patriotism of the day was going against God. God told Jeremiah, don't pray for these people for their good. He said, I'm not going to bless them. As a matter of fact, you tell them they're going into captivity and that's exactly what's going to happen. And so Jeremiah preaches exactly what God tells him to do. And of course they take his scroll, they burn it. All these things happen to Jeremiah. But notice here, if you come down to chapter number 37, he's preaching and uh, going back through some things with the captivities. And come down to verse number uh, 13. When he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the ward was there, whose name was Arijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah. And he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou followest the way to the Chaldeans. In other words, just because he was prophesying that Nebuchadnezzar was going to come and destroy Jerusalem, which he did, they're saying, Oh, you're in cahoots with Nebuchadnezzar. You're falling away to them. You are, this is a, uh, you're a double agent here. You're working for the, for the, uh, the Babylonians. Verse 14, Then said Jeremiah, It is false. I fall not away to the Chaldeans. But he hearkened not to him, so Arijah took Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah and smote him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. When Jeremiah was entered into the dungeon and into the cabins, and Jeremiah had remained there many days, Zedekiah the king sent and took him out, and the king asked him secretly, Is there any word from the Lord? Of course, Jeremiah tells him the same thing. Yeah, there's a word. The same thing I told you before. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. He's going to destroy this place. I think he tells him one time, look, if Nebuchadnezzar only had ten soldiers, he'd still whoop every single one of you. And he does that rebuke, and those scornful scoffers will not listen. There's even a prophet there that says, hey, within a couple of years, God's going to break the yoke off the king of Babylon. And he lies. They're scoffing, they're scorning, they're mocking Jeremiah, and Jeremiah suffers because of it. They take Jeremiah and put him in prison. That's some examples of scorners, and you could, your mind's probably already thinking of some examples in Scripture of men like this and people that have scorned. Now, what about some of these wise men? What, what, what is the difference in a wise person and a scorner? Now, the reason I'm preaching this is because all of us are confronted 
with truth every time we read the Bible. We're confronted with wisdom. Wisdom calls out to us. Hey, come over here and listen to me. Whenever we hear preaching, there's a confrontation that's going on between you and truth and you and wisdom. How are you going to listen to it? Are you going to receive the instruction? Or are you going to, don't preach at me, preacher. Don't get on me, preacher. Look over here in Proverbs. Come back to chapter number 1. Let's look here at a wise man. Then we'll look back in chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 1, look in verse number 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain to wise counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation of the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Look back in chapter number 9, the passage we read about a wise man. He says in verse 9, Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. You ever read that parable where Jesus says that the judgment uh, when he rewards his servants and takes away rewards from those, the one that just has one pound and didn't make anything, it says you take from the guy who's got one and you give it to the guy who's got many. You ever try to think about that? Here's somebody that did something with what God gave them, and God says, I'm going to reward him. You have to take a wise man that listens to instruction. God says, I'm going to give him some instruction. Uh, years ago, and I guess churches still do this, what they try to do is they try to get you into church. And as soon as you get in the church, they try to get you a job and get you tied in and tangled up, and, and tangled up with something so you feel important and so you can stay uh, active in church. And they find people that might not even be very busy. Maybe they don't even attend a whole lot. And they give them a position thinking that if we give them a position in the church, then they'll become faithful. That's just the opposite way that I look at things. I say you find somebody who's working their tail end off and you give them another job. You say, why? Because they're going to do it. Somebody that's lazy, too lazy to even come to church half the time, you think they're going to be responsible to do something they're supposed to do when they're not being prodded and pushed to do it? A wise man will increase and learn more. But a scorner, he won't listen to nothing. And so that's that parable. He says, here's a guy that didn't multiply the talent. He didn't do anything for me. You just take away what he's got and you give it to the guy who, who did work. All right, come over to uh, chapter 19, Proverbs 19. Uh, let's see, let's just go to 17 for sake of time. I can't do all these. 17, Proverbs 17. Look in verse 10. Get this. A reproof entereth more into a wise man than an hundred stripes into a fool. Back in Bible times, they would, they would punish people with crimes. That they committed certain crimes. They would punish them with, they would inflict pain on them. And much like in the Bible where there would be discipline that would be given with a rod. And in Bible times, they would, they would whip someone with 40. They could not exceed, according to Old Testament law, they could not exceed 40 stripes. If they tie somebody up, some guy does something real bad. Back in the day, if a man treated, and, and some of you older folks, maybe you know this, back in the day, if a man treated his wife wrong, some men in the community would take care of that. The woman keeps showing up to church, and she's got black eyes and stuff. You didn't keep, you know, falling as you were washing the clothes outside with the washboard. Something's going on at home, and we're going to come see your husband. I'm not, I'm not saying that's... I'm, not, I'm just telling you that's how it was. In the Bible times, they would inflict whippings, and that had to do with physical punishment. You remember you heard about the old chain gangs. They'd have them out there uh, working on the railroads and stuff. I mean, that wasn't easy work. But here, this verse is telling us that here's a foolish person. You can beat him a hundred times, and it doesn't do any good. But a reproof would do more good to a wise person. You can just tell the wise person one time. You don't even have to inflict pain to make him remember it. You just tell him and he'll take it. But a foolish person, you can beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them. And for what? They're going to run right back into it. 
So a wise person will add to what he learns from wise counsel. Notice in chapter 19, <clears throat> 19 a wise person will listen, excuse me, will not listen to unwise counsel. Look in chapter 19, verse 27. Cease, my son, to adhere the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. So a wise person will take heed to good counsel, and he has discernment to say, this is coming from God, this lines up with the Bible, and then he will not listen to unwise counsel. Anything that's contrary to God and contrary to the Scriptures, he says, I ain't even going to listen to it. Uh, that, that leads me to say this, a wise person will associate with wise people. You can tell a lot by people, tell a lot of people by their friends, who you associate with. They say now, and I'm, I'm out of the workforce, but they say a lot of times when people do hiring and stuff, that they look at people's social media and they find out who all they're tied up to. Who all they're linked up to. Okay, let me find out if this person's going, let me see if these people they're tied up with are honest people. Because, I mean, we're going to have them responsibility. Maybe they're going to have, be responsible with some money or they're going to be responsible with some very high-priced equipment and stuff. Or are they hanging around people that tear up stuff all the time? Or are they hanging around people that steal stuff and have records and warrants on them and, and all this kind of stuff? That's a bad sign. So a wise person says, you know what? I want to be around somebody that's going to pull me up instead of pull me down. Proverbs 13, verse 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I don't know whether Brother Dale can straighten me out, but the, the term when they talk about you know, like you're an accomplice or whatever. In other words, someone's committing a crime and you're with that person, you're, it's just like you're committing the thing. A companion of fools will be destroyed. You want to be wise? Hang around wise people. You want to uh, be someone that turns away from bad things, then you need to hang around people that are interested in listening to God and to God's Word. So that's a description of a wise person. Um, a wise person will not... Um, go to chapter 3. A wise person, in his estimation of himself, he's the opposite of a scorner. So that means he's not full of conceit. He's not full of pride. He's not unteachable. You know, little kids can teach you things. So, well, I'm smarter than a little kid, and I know little children can teach you things. You men in here, your, your wives can teach you some things. You ladies, your husbands can teach you some things. Maybe not about cooking. <laughs> but there's some things that we can learn from everybody. This idea that we have arrived, this conceit, this pride, these tenured professors, you know, in these colleges walking around, they got these little 20, 21, 20 year old, 18, 20 to 23 year old kids in their class, and they're up there, they're talking the big talk like they're somebody. Yeah, they don't have any competition. They, they're full of conceit, pride. Look in chapter 3, verse number 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. The other verse I have, you don't have to turn to it, Proverbs 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. So that's not a wise person, someone that's full of conceit. A wise person does not think so highly above himself that he's above instruction, that he's above learning. That's why you can get somebody, maybe they've only been preaching a few years, they've only been preach, preaching three or four years, and they get up and they shell the corn, they preach the Bible. Maybe they're even younger than you. And you can sit there and you can submit under that authority from the Bible, and you can learn something from them. Man, sometimes, and I'm not telling you do this, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure some of you do, man, I'll listen to some of these people that don't even believe exactly like we do. You know, they're on the radio or something. You know, they're preaching out of RSV or whatever, the NIV, whatever the thing is. But, you know, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and again. I'm not above learning something from somebody else. Wise people fear the Lord. Look back in chapter number 9 of Proverbs. 
And you see it all through here. We we'll don't have time to run all the references. But it's right after he gives this passage about a wise person getting instruction, he mentions in verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So wise people do not think above themselves. They fear God. They won't listen to unwise counsel. They add what they know. They add to what they know from other wise uh, counsel. And they preserve what they've gained. He says in chapter 10, look at it in chapter number 10, verse 14. Proverbs 10, 14. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. They chew on things. Sometimes when you read, when you study the Bible, and when you hear preaching, you, need to, you get a thought, you get a message, you get an idea, and you need, to, you need to lay it up, you need to chew on it. You need to write it down maybe. Underline it. Because there will be a time that you may need that. Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. Joseph was a very wise man. He departed from evil. When Potiphar got, Potiphar's wife got close to him and began to tempt him, you know what he did? He got out of the house. He fled, the Bible says, and got him out. He's a wise person. Wise people discipline their speech. Proverbs 16, 23. A heart of a wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Boy, we could take heed to that. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Proverbs 10, 19. If you're going to be wise, you're going to have to learn to try to, put, try to tame the tongue. And then wise people are diligent in their work. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. You see that? And then they encourage others to seek the Lord. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Just a few examples and we're done. The main example, I think, when I think about a scorner getting rebuke and a wise person taking rebuke, we've got Cain, we've got Jezebel and these other scorners. And then I take, think of a wise man taking rebuke. I think of King David. Remember when Nathan came in and he told him that parable? And he illustrated how that this man had stolen this other man's lamb and and David says, well, we're going to kill that guy and we're going, to, we're going to make him restore those lambs. Nathan pointed his finger and says, thou art the man. What does David do when he hears that rebuke? He says, I have sinned, not just like Pharaoh and Balaam, they say I have sinned. But David said, I have sinned against the Lord. David was a great sinner, but he was a great repenter. And he took the rebuke. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, the Bible says. If you've got a, a close friend, and everybody, if you've got one or two good friends in your life, you, you're a success as far as friendship goes. That's a blessing. A lot of people don't have that. But if you have a faithful friend that you can be honest enough. See, a lot of us, we know each other, but we don't know each other close enough to where we'll just go up and start correcting each other about stuff, you know. I mean, hey, I ain't going to tell you about eating your Twinkies. You know, you want to eat your Twinkies? Eat them, man. But you have a close enough friend that says, hey, this ain't right. Or you're close enough you can say, tell me what you think. Now, a husband and wife relationship ought to be a whole lot further down the road than just, hey, what was the weather like today? You ought to be able to talk about some things and risk being rejected of your idea and opinion. In other words, you ought to love each other enough to say, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think and see even if you are going to maybe not agree with me, I can take it. You talk about thin skin, man. We are in the most thin skinned society I have ever seen in my life. It's because we're so far away from, from reproof. People can't take reproof at all. I guess they can take it maybe from their personal trainer or maybe from their doctor or maybe from their dietitian. Or I don't know, but for somebody to tell them, look, you're not doing a good job. Oh, I'm not? You'll hear from my lawyer. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to last in the workforce today. I, I don't believe I would. I don't think I could handle it. So I think of David, I think of Jacob. He went through a lot of things in his life. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord and he, he, he never walked the same after that. When he got to the end of his life, he was truly humbled. 
Jacob, when he gets to the end, as much of a supplanter as he was, as much of a conniver he was, when he gets to the end and Pharaoh's there and Jacob's the old man now, now he's the one blessing the, the king of the, the superpower of the world of that day. He reaches out of that old gnarly hand to bless Pharaoh and he gives that humble estimation of himself. He says, few and evil have the days of my life been, and my life, days of my life have not attained unto the years of my father's. He could take rebuke. What about Simon Peter after he told the Lord, I won't deny you, I won't deny you, I love you so much, I won't deny you. He goes out there and denies the Lord three times. The Lord told him exactly what would happen. The rooster crows, he turns and Christ is being led away and he's in, in uh, eyesight of Christ and he turns and looks upon Peter. The Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. He took that rebuke. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, you know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. So I want to encourage you to be wise instead of foolish. I want to encourage you to be wise instead of a scorner. Wisdom says, listen to me in my words. The world says, just turn off God's words. Just don't take reproof. It's negative. It grinds. It, the, preaching is always just, it just wears you out. Don't listen. You're okay. You're fine. Your opinion's good. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The Bible's, you know, outdated. It's antiquated. You, you, that's just back for that time. You don't need to listen. Wisdom says, He that hath an ear, let him hear. And when God rings your bell, whether it's through preaching, whether it's through your personal reading, take the reproof, learn from it, grow in it, and add to that instruction. And hopefully, if we can do that, because it's really a strange thing. I mean, you think about it. You come to church, and sometimes it gets kind of rough, and you're listening to a guy peel the bark back and, and kind of talk to you rough, and you come back. <laughs> I like hard preaching, man. I'm not talking about harsh preaching. The harder, the better. I like it when the guy peels it back. And I like it when it's loud, but I also like it when it's, it gets real quiet. And very convicting. You ever have those messages? It gets quiet and convicting. It's just like razor blades. Slice, 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 slice. You're thinking, why would you want to come and keep exposing yourself to that? Because we need it. We need the rebuke. He says, preach the word and be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, then exhort. Uh, one, thank God we got a little bit of exhortation, but the reproof and the rebuke is so much needed. I need it, and I think we all need it. So hopefully we can be take wise reproof from the Lord. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for time we can open up the Bible. God, I pray that we would always submit to your words. Lord, help us. We get arrogant sometimes. We get full of ourselves. We think we know it. And God, I pray that You'd, you'd help us to realize pride has no place in the pulpit. It has no place in the pew. God, help us as believers to open up this book humbly, to take the reproof, to take the medicine. And God, I pray that you would straighten us out, that you would give us the right prescriptions in our daily lives. And Lord, help us as we have discernment when we deal with people to realize everybody doesn't want to listen. And we have to be careful as we deal with people, some people want it, Lord, and we need to dump it on them. We need to give it to them. And the ones who don't, well, we just can't, we can't waste our time with them, Lord. We, we try to give them the truth, Lord. But help us to have that discerning heart as we try to reach a world. And Lord, give us a burden and help us to fulfill that commission that you've called us to do. Thank you for these words of wisdom, this word of truth that we have in the Bible. We pray that you might bless us throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.